This is what being Patrick Bateman means to me. Welcome, Duncan. Thank you so much. Congratulations on American Psycho. Ah, thank you. <laughs> this show has been a long time in the making, right? Yeah, we, uh, we started, well, they first started talking to me about it in 2009. So it's been like a six year process, which is actually fairly quick for musicals, believe it or not. But. I was one of your original Kickstarter donation uh, donors. So. Thank you. Very uh, so much I've for been that. waiting it for 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 a long time. I guess that's that's what I should say. Um, but you read the book in college, right? I did. Um, I was a big Brett Easton Ellis fan, and I, I loved Less Than Zero when I was in high school. Um, and so when American Psycho came out in '91, I think I was a junior or senior, and I was going to Brown University, and uh, I read the book, and I was. I actually found it really off-putting, not just because of the violence, but just because of the, the endless lists of clothing items and food. And I was like, there's, there's no plot to this. It's just this like completely, it's like the banality of evil somehow. And it was also a little bit too close to home, not necessarily to myself, but maybe some of my friends that I uh, was going to school with. So I didn't quite get the satire. Um, so it took me another, 18 years to be able to read the book and really appreciate it for the, the classic that it is. Yeah, I think that the book, the movie, and this show, if you don't understand it as satire, it's pretty disturbing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> I, I think, you know, again, when I, when I read it at the time, I was like, this is not what novels are supposed to be. <laughs> throw, throw it out. But, it's uh, a sign of a groundbreaking work, I yes, think. Yes, yeah. Um, I'm going to step away from American Psycho for a second. We'll circle back around to it. But sure. um, speaking of groundbreaking works, uh, I think I'd be remiss to not mention Spring Awakening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which is now 10 years since it had its debut on Broadway. You're right. I didn't quite think about it that way, but yes. <laughs> and then it had a resurgence on Broadway this year, a revival. Yeah, a very beautiful revival with uh, Deaf West Theater. Um, and Michael Arden just did this extraordinary job of, of reconceiving the piece for, you know, hearing impaired audiences. And uh, I was really proud of what they did. Did you go see it? Oh, yeah, I was there much of the time. And I was working with uh, um, the musicians and, you know, going over the guitar voicings. And, uh, and I, in fact, I saw it. There were two different iterations in LA before it came to Broadway. So I was at each of those, and, um, and I, it was just this wonderful, beautiful gift that, that some producers decided to bring it to New York, and I'm so happy they did. Well, I'm happy that they did as well, um, and I'm, I'm also very happy that the show was created. As I mentioned to you backstage, I, I saw it an embarrassing number of times. That's great. Uh, <laughs> we love and, that. And I went and saw American Psycho for the third time in three weeks cool. last night. So nice. it is a truly remarkable piece of theater. Um, can you talk a little bit about bringing the show from London where it had a sold out run to Broadway and the changes that took place? Yes. Well, you know, I think when, when we did the show in London, we were all a little bit afraid of being too intense and too gory, and it may be seeming too, frankly, too misogynist. Uh, and, you know, I mean, not, you know, nobody on the creative team is a fan of violence against women, and we would never want it to really? seem like that, that, you know, that that was something that we were celebrating on any level. I mean, it is, this, the show is ultimately a critique of, a, of an ethos and a mindset and, and of many things that, ha that go on in the culture. But it's also, you know, it, it does need to be, a, it's an entertainment as well. So it's trying to 
you know, trying to find our way into that. And uh, so, when, so when we did it in London, we were um, maybe a little coy about, about the violence. Uh, but in fact, the, the comments we got from audiences, both men and women, were like, it needs to be more violent. <laughs> we want more blood. Uh, and I think, you know, in some ways the culture is more desensitized to it now, um, for better or worse. You know, if, if you watch an episode of Game of Thrones, it's ten times bloodier than anything, you know, in our show. But, uh, but so, when, so when we came to New York, we wanted to do some stuff that made it a little more visceral and more intense. Uh, and then musically, also, I wanted to ha I wanted the music to kind of hit harder and be less kind of purely a late 80s uh, kind of formulation and sound picture and maybe some more kind of contemporary sounding EDM. Well, that's probably my favorite thing about the music, uh, which is available, by the way, the London cast recording is available now. Um, are we going to get in a, a U.S. cast recording? Do we? I mean, I certainly hope so. Um, we, we may... Uh, I shouldn't give this away, but we may be filming the show, in which case there, there, we would get a, a, a kind of a soundtrack out of that. So... Um, but don't tell anyone. I just told you. <laughs> um, so, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. But I, of course, I want to make one. Of course. Uh, the music is simultaneously uh, reminiscent of the '80s, but it doesn't feel like a throwback. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's this layering of sound that you're able to do through. Is it synthesizers? Well, yeah. So basically, um, there there are kind of two sets of gear that I used to to create the score. Um, and one set of gear are, they're like synthesizers and drum machines that I've had in my dorm room since, you know, since the 80s, like a Roland Juno 106 and a TR-909 drum machine and a Mini Moog and a Prophet 5. So all this kind of old school analog synthesizer stuff. And then there's another uh, set of things that were done in a, in a piece of software called Ableton Live, which is like, it, it's really... Uh, it's, it's music production software that was initially created by DJs in, in, in Berlin, um, but it's an incredibly deep and powerful tool. So it was, it was a combination of technologies, both old and, and new. And you did most of, you did all of the orchestrations yourself, right? Yeah, or, orchestrations such as they are. It feels a little like cheeky to call them orchestrations. Because there's because not actually an orchestra. There's, you know, there's barely a real instrument in sight. There's some guitars. I cheated and I used some guitars. But, uh, but it's 90% synthesizers and drum machines. Yeah, I noticed at the end of the show um, where normally the cast would motion down to the orchestra pit and acknowledge the conductor. Yeah. You, there are a couple of guys up in each of the upper boxes um, and everybody applauds them. What are those guys doing? <laughs> are they pressing computer buttons? It, one of them it, has a guitar, at least. Yeah, yeah, one has a guitar, one has an electronic drum kit, um, and then two of them are playing keyboards and then triggering the Ableton and manipulating some of the technology you know, up there. Um, so it was, again, my initial conception of the band, like the band in the pit, was that it would be four people at synthesizers, like Kraftwerk or, or Depeche Mode or something like that. So. I kind of, now I've got my little mini Depeche Mode up there every night, which is great. Well, Depeche Mode, the actual band, is not featured in the show. No. But there are some. I tried. There I, are, I did tried. you? I tried to get Everything Counts in Large Amounts in there, but it didn't, it didn't happen. A bonus track. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, yeah. Uh, but you did work in some of the 80s music in, were all the songs that, that you used, the actual 80s songs, were, and they were in the movie, or no? No, not necessarily. Same era, To Be Square was, obviously. Oh, oh yes. But, um, no, I mean, but I'm... you have Tears for Fears. Yeah. I'm more of an Anglophile in terms of my musical taste, so I went more for Tears for Fears and New Order and Phil Collins and, and Human League, and then Huey Lewis is our token American on, the, <laughs> but on there. He, he was at the show last night. He was a really lovely man. <laughs> Huey Lewis was? Yeah, yeah. Didn't he have some issues with his music being used in the movie? Uh, he might have initially, but then he, he completely embraced it. And I know he even made a, a, a music video of, of him playing Patrick Bateman. It yeah, it was, a, it was yes. a satire video with yeah. Weird Al. Uh, right, right. That was, it's very funny. Yeah. Uh, so, so Hip to be Square is actually, the Huey Lewis version is used in the, in the show, but the other yeah. songs you completely reconceived and, um, and 
I guess orchestrated is the word yes. I want again. Yeah, well, there's some there's some very intense vocal arrangements for the other for the other songs. Huey Lewis is it's diegetic. In the scene, he literally just presses play on the tape recorder, and, and the song starts playing, and they start dancing like white male idiots dance. That you know? those <laughs> dance moves that they do yeah. in that scene are. I could watch them on a loop forever. Yeah, it's one of my ever. favorite parts of this show, for sure. Um, but the other songs, you know, I, my, again, my initial conception was that they, they all be just choral arrangements of the songs, so they sound completely different. Um, and in the case of In the Air Tonight, it's this really stunning vocal arrangement that Jason Hart did. Uh, but then the, the New Order as well, and, and the Human League, David Shrubsoul, wrote some really cool vocal arrangements for those. So they're kind of this weird combination of like beats and then multi, you know, kind of four part multi-voice harmonies. I've been listening to the London cast recording a lot as I've walked around the city and I'm used to having music in my ears all the time and it's sort of half listening to it. Mm. I find it impossible to half listen to this recording, it feels all encompassing. It feels like it's all around me and it just like gets into my blood. And it's been a long time since I could say that about a, a, an album. Thank you so much. We tried, we tried. You also have a new album yourself out, a Duncan Cheek record, mm -hmm. which is your first one in how long? Well, it, it depends what you count. I mean, I, I made a couple covers. I made a covers album in 2011. And before that, I released like a concept album that was also a piece of theater called Whisper House in 2009. But the last like regular Duncan Sheik album was 2006. So I guess it was nearly 10 years. Yeah. Um, sorry about that. But um, <laughs> anyway, but I was busy, you know, and that's what happens. Well, quality over quantity <laughs> always. Yeah. Um, and can you say the name of the album again? Because I oh, keep trying to pronounce it with a French yeah. accent. No, it's, it's just called Ledger Domain, which means sleight of hand. So, right, which yeah. is that a reference to the card tricks in American Psycho? No. There's, there's this number called cards where if you know, if you know the movie American Psycho, mm -hmm. the business card exchange scene is completely iconic, probably my favorite scene from the movie. And the choreographer for American Psycho worked in all of these sleight of hand tricks. Yeah. And that was, of course, the first thing I thought of when I saw the name yeah. of your record. No, that's just a happy confluence of events. It wasn't my, wasn't my idea. But, um, no, but Ledger Domain, I mean, what, you know, it's, it's, the record is called Sleight of Hand because the first half of it is mostly electronic music, which I think, you know, it's, how can I put it? It's sort of like cheating in a way, making music with technology, but in a good way. Um, and then the second half of the record is all much more organic and m much more internal, and there's lots of real instruments, but it's played really softly, so it's like the more almost literal, uh, little, literal idea of sleight of hand. I described it to someone earlier today as the first album I've heard that feels like EDM meets singer-songwriter. Yeah, that was, that was the idea. I mean, you know, I, uh, like I, I'm a huge fan of, of, of people like Disclosure and people like, you know, Richie Houghton and Bass Nectar and, uh, you know, there's, it's, this is music that I, that I could never really make myself, but I wanted to marry some of the aesthetics of those things to songs. And, um, you know, I don't know if it worked or not, but it was a lot of fun doing it. Do you have any musical theater uh, composers that you, uh, that you love, that you listen to? Well, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm buddies with Michael Friedman and, and I'm friends with Lin-Manuel and I'm friends with Larry O'Keefe and, um, you know, I, I mean, th those guys are all extraordinarily talented, but they're, kind, you know, they, they kind of truly come from a musical theater background, whereas I kind of snuck in the side door much later, you know. So you're not going home and listening to Cole Porter and Rodgers and Hart? Uh, you know, I mean, no, no, I do. I mean, I do. I, but it's but it's more just to to understand the canon than than I necessarily listen to it for for pleasure. I mean, for, you know, the things that I listen to are just really obscure alternative European and English bands. Well, I'm glad that you're bringing that to the stage because American Psycho is certainly like nothing else that's on Broadway now or has ever been, and I love that. I want yeah. more of that. 
Yeah, I, me too. Uh, <laughs> but, um, and I, you know, I knew it would be polarizing. I didn't know it would be quite as polarizing <laughs> as it has been. But, uh, but, you know, I wanted to make a strong statement about the fact, you know, that, that musical theater can sound like anything you want it to sound like. It, you know, it doesn't, you know, you don't necessarily need to always be paying obeisance to the past. Let's talk about the blood. Yeah. Uh, there is a, a fair amount of blood in the show. Um, there was a f- news story recently about a woman whose uh, designer bag got, got a, a hit by some blood in yes. the front row. I'd yeah. just like to say I sat in the front row and got hit by some blood. Yeah. And I considered that a, like yeah. the luckiest, coolest thing that ever happened to me. Yeah. I would not have been complaining about it. Well, look, if you buy a ticket to the front row of American Psycho and you, bring, and you dress in Burberry and you bring a Louis Vuitton bag then you deserve all the blood on you you can get. I also do think that that was probably some of the best publicity that the show could have gotten. Um, it made me want to, you know, <laughs> to go back and, and... No, I think it worked out. When we, did, we did, in fact, pay for the cleaning of the items, though. <laughs> There's, it reminds me that, I mean, it's, it's, it's life imitating art. The first scene yeah. of the show oh. is he's going to the dry cleaner to get blood removed from yeah. a designer item. Yeah, the irony could not be more beautiful. Yeah. I love it. Um, and you mentioned um, in the book the lists of food and fashion. Yeah. How much of a foodie, how much of a fashionista are you and have you become? Well, I'm, like, I'm wearing my Comme des Garçons sneakers right now. So. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and what's the food rhyme in the show? Well, there's a, there's a lot of them, but... No, um, but the one about Comme des Garçons. No, Comme des Garçons is actually... I, it's, it's rhymed with Betsy Johnson, which oh, right. in, in one review, the, re, the reviewer was really pissed off. He's like, Betsy Johnson doesn't even remotely rhyme with Comme des Garçons. <laughs> and I was like, is that what you were paying attention to? <laughs> anyway, um, so yeah, there's, you know, there's, there's Oscar de la Renta and Creme de Menta. I don't know, it's all just really silly, but meant to be. Um, and I'd never written a list song before, mm-hmm. so that was a lot of fun. And that is kind of, you know, there's a, a great musical theater tradition of list songs, so um, it was nice to be able to do that. I do love the shoes. Thanks. Have any of the designers in the show uh, reached out to you and offered to outfit you? And No, but I mean, Calvin Klein was there the other night, and Anna Wintour was there the other night, oh. and... Um, I'm hoping Diane von Furstenberg comes. She's, she gets a shout out in there. Yeah, um, but in the choreography too. Yeah, the rap dress. It's a rap. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think they'll. I think they're they're showing up to the show, which is really cool. Has anyone from the movie come to see the show? Um, that's a great question. I I'm not sure. I think I think Chloe Sevigny is, is coming, um, and of course we really want Christian Bale to come, but he's probably you know, busy making some huge movie. So we'll see. Cool. Um, We're going to go to questions from the audience in a minute. But first, I want to ask you about other projects that are coming up for you. Well, so um, the next couple of musical theater things I'm working on, uh, I'm doing an adaptation of Secret Life of Bees uh, with the director, Sam Gold, and the uh, playwright, Lynn Nottage. Um, So that'll be really 180 degree (laughs) turn different different is that going to be an edm musical no (laughs) it's set in south carolina in the civil rights era so it it will not there will be very little electronic music that would be a revolutionary yeah (laughs) uh and then i'm doing a an adaptation of alice in wonderland with steven Sater, my partner from spring awakening and uh that uh we're going to be working with the great director john doyle and that should happen uh in 2017 will the actors be playing instruments Traditional John Doyle uh, that's style. That's a great question. Po- very possibly, um, but you know that 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 is a, a kind of a um, an amalgam of organic and electronic instruments. Just because I wanted to do stuff that's sonically, you know, really out there and psychedelic, just given the nature of that of that source material. Uh, but Stephen has found a really really interesting take on on that on that story, which is it's hard to do Alice in Wonderland as a show because it's so episodic and it doesn't have a very satisfying narrative arc. But I think Stephen found a way to, to write a show that is this really, it's very meta, but it's a really beautiful story um, that uses all the characters from, from the book we all know and love. So um, hopefully it'll be really cool. I don't know, we'll And the see. question I've been waiting years to ask you, 
what's happening with the Spring Awakening movie. Yeah. Um, you know, we have some wonderful producers. Uh, Tom Hanks' company, Playtone, has been helping to shepherd it along. And um, we just need to find the right ingredients, uh, really, and really the director at this point. Um, and, you know, we're patient. We're waiting for the right person to come along and has, has the right vision for the for the movie, because for me personally, you know, there are very, very few musical movies that that stand up and over the test of time. I mean, there's, you know, Cabaret and Dancer in the Dark and Sound of Music, and I start running out after that, you know, after those three. So I just want to make sure that, that it's a really beautiful, artfully done musical movie. Um, oh, I should include Baz Luhrmann's made a couple good ones too. But but you know it's a hard, it's a very hard form, um, and I think you know we really want a uh, an, an auteur director to come in and help us make that film. Has there been any talk about incorporating some of the Deaf West stuff into the film? Yeah, I mean there you know there there could be a version of the movie that 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 used that. Um, aspect and that choreography it was so powerful but you know it's kind of not I'm not the director so it's not really my department well cool. yeah. um, we have time for a couple questions yeah. from the audience absolutely yeah. we're gonna start with an online viewer question okay so Miley would like to know is it your opinion that all the killings are a figment of Patrick's psychosis yeah I mean that's a great question I, I certainly in our show I, I read it that way um, I asked Brett Easton Ellis when I first met him uh, if if Patrick Bateman is is murdering these people like in real life or is it something that's just happening in his head, and Brett would not answer the question. That's you know, for you to decide. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's sort of the death of the author. It's just like it's however the reader interprets it. I do I do think of it as something that's happening in his head, and I think clearly you know if you see what happens in the second act and. Um, You'll know what I mean. That it's like it's this is you're all you're seeing all of the insanity through his own perspective. And well, you also get to see a lot of Ben Walker almost naked in his underwear. And yeah. that yeah, that alone worth the ticket price. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he's pretty easy on the eyes. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> but but anyway, I, you know, I'm not, I'm a like I'm a practicing Buddhist, and again, I like I'm really not a big fan of of horror and movies or things that are really gory. Like, it's not my, it's not my taste. So that be became my way of rationalizing it and, uh, and thinking of it more as a, you know, as a, as a metaphor or a, you know, uh, I don't know. It's, it, you know, it's, the show really is about ideas. Um, it's, it's not about m murdering people per se. It's about, it's about what late capitalism can do to your head, uh, and and so, um, in that sense, it is kind of an allegory. In fact, it doesn't feel, from an audience perspective, like a horror show. It feels like commentary. Yes, yeah, and and you know, we hope that people see it that way, but definitely some people don't. You know, so <laughs> um, uh, that was. It's been really interesting to see the reactions, but. Look, it's you know we've got 900 or a thousand people going to the show every night, and they're they're laughing kind of you know they're laughing with us and kind of at us and, and at the satire in a in a and they're really getting it. Um, so that's that's been heartening. How's it going, Duncan? Hey, hey. I gotta say, uh, Ben is absolutely killing it, and he looks really great. Yeah. He's uh, killing I mean, it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, I got. I'm curious. Uh, when it came to casting, um, were you looking for any specific aesthetic or characteristics for the actors to embody? And what was the audition process like? It was. It was definitely the hardest auditioning process I've ever been in, because um, you have a very uh, exacting creative team, and and frankly, a creative team with 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 different agendas in some way. Um, and 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 of course, you know, uh, they. They needed to be amazing dancers. They needed to look really incredible. They need to be great actors, and they need to sing um, very well. And um, it's just it's it's hard for one person to embody all of those things. And so there was a lot of headbutting in the 
in the in the process, and we saw so many talented people. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people. And I'm, you know, therefore I think we have this really fantastic, amazing cast. But it was hard. It was hard to get there. Not just Ben. I mean, Alice every, Ripley yeah, and, and Damiano and Helena York. I mean, and the whole ensemble is just fantastic. Yeah, and Theo Stockman. Is oh my gosh, Theo Stockman! Yeah. I've I've been like walking around imitating him because yeah. he's so funny. He's so funny. Yeah. So I'm I'm so proud of of all the hard work that those guys have done. Hey Duncan, I saw the show Saturday. It was so good. I can't even describe it. I, I'm cl disclosure is close. It, I, I'm close to describing it as a LVMH fashion show where they act it out, and disclosure is live DJing. Cool. But <laughs> good. I, That's can I use that? <laughs> use whatever you want. And I'm also going to vouch. So my we won the lottery, and we sat in um, in a box right next to the drummer. He yeah. was fully drumming the whole time. Yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah. Um, and I think he was from Spring Awakening. Did you bring he, some men over? Yeah, well, yeah, Mark, both Marcus and Tad, the guitar player, are alumnuses of the Spring Awakening bands. I mean, they did different, different versions of the show, but they've both been in Spring Awakening band. Uh, and, and then Jason Hart is my longtime music director. He tours with me. And Charlie Rosen is this incredibly multi-talented, uh, uh, you know, kind of keyboard player, bass player, guitar player. Um, so we've got we've got four really incredible musicians. In a way, they're I don't want to say they're underused because there is, but there's so much technology happening in in, in the music that um, you know there's they could probably be playing a lot more. But it's um, but I needed to be kind of strict about what the sound of the show is. Do you think there, you would ever do like an American Psycho unplugged experience? Like, what would that yeah. sound like? I mean, yeah, it would. It would take some doing um, to figure out the the kind of the orchestrations for that, um, and um, I, <laughs> someone else would have to do it because I'm right now. It's like it's been six years of my life. I need to move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of moving on, it's yeah. time for us to wrap up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for being here, Duncan. Everybody pick up Duncan's album, The American Psycho, London Cast Recording. Go see American Psycho live on Broadway. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for watching at home. Cheers. Thank you.